So as, as Joe mentioned earlier with his face shield, even with something as small as pin turning, it can go wrong. God only gave you two eyes. So you've got a chance for one mistake. Is it Norm Abram that said, uh, there's, what do you say about the safety glasses? There's no more important rule than to wear your safety glasses. So any time, anytime you get around the lathe, I mean, even if it's for something small, um, please wear safety glasses or a face shield. So several years ago, I wanted to make my wife something for Christmas, and I hadn't done any wood turning or any woodworking for, well, ever. You know, I've, I've been always one of those guys that had, had a bunch of tools and really didn't do anything with them. Had a table saw, drill, you know, stuff that you normally would have around the house. I wanted to make her something. So I walked into Woodcraft for the first time in my life and was really overwhelmed. But what really caught my eye was the wall of pins and the different kits that you could get in Woodcraft. And of course, now we have Rockler, so we have some competition there. Well, that really... I don't know, something clicked when I saw that wall of pins. And the first thing I thought of, you can make a pin out of wood? I had never heard of such a thing. And and it, I feel kind of embarrassed, like I've led a sheltered life or something like that. Never heard that you can make a pin out of wood. So I went home, got on the internet. Of course, that took me to YouTube. And you look at pin turning videos on YouTube. And there are literally thousands of pin turning videos on YouTube. Um, you know, looking back on it now, I started out in pin turning, which pin turning is a gateway drug to wood turning because I found out that once you got hooked in pin turning, well, then you need this and then you need this and then you need this and then you meet Joe and he tells you, you need this and you need this and you need this. So at the end of the day, what started out as a small hobby, and by the way, I went on uh, Craigslist found a used Rikon lathe. Um, in fact, there's another story behind that as well. But I got a, a little Rikon lathe, and the guy that I bought it from, he gave me some uh, some turning tools and the pin mandrel and things like that. I'll go into that in a little bit. But you know, I didn't know what I was getting into, to be honest with you. Because here, here I am several years later, and several thousand dollars later, you know, I, I, most of y'all know, was it last year, year before I got one of these lathes? Uh, and yeah, it's, a, it's, 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 it's blown up. Um, so yeah, so it, it, pin turning, it, you know, it's, you don't need a lot of equipment, but you'll find out that if you, if you start turning pins that you're going to be, well, I want to try this. I want to try this. And it just requires more and more and more equipment. But at the initially, low cost, minimal equipment's needed. Um, the only problem is, is that, like I said, that there are thousands of YouTube videos and there are thousands and thousands of different ways to take a piece of wood and make it into a pen. Um, you just going to find out what works for you. Uh, I mean, I could, I could stand up, we could stand up here until October and talk about different ways to take this block of wood and turn it to a pen and still not cover all the bases that old saying in wood turning if you ask 10 wood turners a question or their opinion you're going to get 20 opinions in return um, so yeah you just got to find out what works for you there's two constants in wood turning or i'm sorry pen turning initially you're going to need a pen kit and you're going to piece of wood now we could go in, and this is another topic for another discussion. Then you get into the uh, kitless pens, where guys take a piece of acrylic and they fashion the entire pen. No kit is needed. The only thing that they need is a fountain pen nib that goes into the end of the pen. But since we're talking about wood pen, this is a piece of paduk. I think is it Randy Hawk at the uh, woodworkers that used to do the wood identification. I think he told me at one point in time there were over 20,000 species of wood on the planet. So there's 20,000 different pins that you can make there. When, yeah. And then you get into acrylic, you get into resin, you can even turn pins out of uh, deer antler. 
thousands of different combinations for making a pen, thousands of different uh, pen kits. <clears throat> but we want to start out, let me find a place to put that. You start out essentially, let me back up. I'm going to just show you one way of making a pen tonight. Uh, I'll go into different methods as far as different steps that it takes, but this I, this is a method that I found that works for me real quick to make a pen out of wood. Start with a pen blank. They're typically uh, five or six inches in length, three quarter, seven eighths inch square. You can actually take a piece of wood that you buy, take it to your table saw, your band saw, cut your own pen blanks. The only thing that you need to make be aware if you make your own pen blanks is make sure that they are dry before you turn them into a pen because as we all know wood moves uh, on a bowl this big around if it moves a millimeter you're not going to be able to tell if it moves a millimeter on your pen you'll be able to tell so you need to make sure that your wood is dry so the very first pen that i made once i got the lathe and got my equipment didn't have any idea what i was doing got a pen kit um Went out to the firewood and found a piece of black walnut. Took it over to my saw, cut it up into a pen blank. And I actually have the very first pen that I turned several years ago that I'm going to pass around. I'm not particularly proud of that one. It, uh, it's not as perfect as I would try to make it now. Uh, there are imperfections. But, but yeah, $3 pen kit, piece of firewood, there's a pen. Uh, that actually has a CA finish on it that I'm not going to talk about tonight. I'll talk a little bit about it, but we will not be doing a, um, a CA finish. So the first thing that you need to do is take your pen blank. That particular pen is called a slimline. That's where a lot of people start making their pens. Uh, the reason is, is it's a $3 kit. You're not going to be, you know, you're not spending a lot on the kits. Uh, the, the only problem with them that I see now is they take twice the work. You've got an upper barrel and you've got a lower barrel. So those need to be turned. You've got two barrels to turn, two better barrels to finish. They have uh, pin kits now, the one we're going to turn tonight. This, this is an example of a two-barrel pin. This was made out of, I think, dyed stabilized Buckeye Burl cigar pin. And then they have single-barrel pins. And this is similar to the one that we're going to make tonight. So whether it's a, uh, a two barrel pin or a single barrel pin that you'll be working with, pin kits come with brass tubes. And you take the brass tube, and what I want to do is I want to put about between a 3 sixteenths and an eighth from the edge of my pin blank and come back on the other side with it and make a little mark. So I want a little bit extra on each side of that tube. And there's my pin blank. Next step. Is to cut the blank. And there's a different, there's different messages you can do. You can, uh, Use table saw, miter saw. I typically use a band saw for it. And before I forget, if you're doing a double barrel pen, you want to do it like this. We get onto the other side. You mark your upper barrel, and you come down here. Assuming and most most pen kits, the barrels, except with the slim line. The barrels are not the same size, so you'll need to use your lower barrel tube to mark the lower barrel of your blank. So now you've got both you got both blanks marked, but in order to put them back together, once you finish the pen, is you need to put witness marks on it. Now those witness marks will allow you to match the grain when the pin goes back together. So this will be your top barrel, this will be your lower barrel, and where the witness marks is, sorry, where the witness marks are at is where 
that will join together and make the double barreled pin. You you will turn them off, but what I typically do on a um, what I typically do with one of those in that sense instance, once I get it once I get the blank trimmed and everything, I'll take a sharpie and just mark the inside of that barrel at the center point, and then in the uh, the, the lower barrel, I'll mark the center point of that. That way, when everything's said and done, I'll still have little marks inside the pin that I'll know to match them up. So, being that we don't have a table saw, band saw, or motor saw here, I cut one. So now we need to get a hole drilled in that blank all the way through for the pin tube. And there's a couple different ways that you can do that. If you use a drill press, what you want to do is get a center finder. Mark that center. Is that showing up? There's an X there that shows the center. And this is a pin vise, pin blank vise. That goes on your drill on your drill press. But I usually take a center punch, mark that hole. That way when I'm bringing down the drill press, I know that that is going to be on the center. It's not really as crucial when you're dealing with a blank such as this. As long as you're close to center, you're fine. It's when you get into other materials that you don't have a lot to work with, um, you want to make sure that you're dead center on that. <clears throat> so that's how I used to drill the holes in my pin blanks. What I do now is I drill them on the lathe. And what I have found in drilling on the lathe when you're, when you're drilling on a drill press, you're mashing down. Of course, you need to clear your flutes, which I'll show you in just a little bit. You need to clear the flutes of the drill bit. But when you're mashing down, you're, you're adding pressure. And it doesn't, it doesn't really happen so much in the wood pin blanks, but when you're dealing with resin or acrylic, you may blow out the bottom of that blank and it will be, well, completely unusable. So what I like is I like to do them on the glaze now. Sometimes before you drill, it's beneficial to use a center finder. I'm sorry, a center bit. These will not wander on you. So I want to make sure that everything's good. And all I want to really do here is just touch into it. And make that center hole. I have found that six seven hundred RPM works good here when you're dealing with acrylics or even wood. Um, you can lock them up, get things too hot. And just slow and steady pressure. As you can see, I'm holding with my left hand the Jacob's chuck. And you can see that the, the shavings aren't coming out like they were. They're wrapping around the flute. I know that my flute's getting clogged. So back to my toothbrush. When I'm doing with this with acrylic, I usually use a brad point bit. And the reason for that is the brad point bit has that little point on the very end of it. And that point is actually going to come out of the back side of this blank before anything else will. So you can look between, you can see that air in there. And you'll be able to see the end of that brad point bit pop out of the end of that blank if you're going slow. That way you need to that would that tells you to go extra slow so you won't blow out the bottom 
of the blank if you're, uh, especially if you're doing acrylics. So the next part on making a pen is we need to glue the tube. Oh, by the way, I forgot to mention this particular pen kit requires that that hole be 27 64ths, which was on the, um, which was the bit that I used. If you've never turned a pen, a specific pen or a pen kit before, it's always good to look at the directions. On this particular one, it's the Gatsby pen kit. It calls that you required accessories, a seven millimeter pen, pen mandrel, not necessary. Uh, bushings, eh. Drill bit, 2764, that's crucial. Uh, barrel trimming sleeve, trimming kit, uh, two part epoxy glue or, inst or, or CA glue, and a live tail sock stinner. But that requires a 2764. So <clears throat> when you're, after I've drilled, if I'm doing a wood pen, after I've drilled it, I let that wood blank sit for a little while. And the reason is I want it to cool off. That heat from the drill bit builds up in there. And if you use CA glue to uh, glue that tube in, that's, that glue will get about halfway in that, or that, that tube will get halfway in the blank and it won't move anymore. Because what happens is the moisture from the wood and the CA glue, they don't like each other. And you will be literally and figuratively stuck like that. And the only thing, real, only way to do to correct that is just to turn the blank off. Sometimes you can come around the backside with another pin tube and meet meet the tubes in the middle, and then cut off the excess. That's one way of doing it. But uh, then you're not really sure exactly how long your pin blank needs to be, because the pin blank or the pin tube here is crucial to the kit, the length of the pin tube. So I like to let them sit for a little while, which this one has been sitting now, that one for about two or three days. So it should be good. And like I said before, I started out gluing my tubes in with uh, CA glue. I've started using two-part epoxy now. Um, I've had too many mistakes with the CA. It, um, CA is very brittle. And I've had too many, too many issues with it in the past. I just like to use two-part epoxy. Whether you use the five-minute, the 15-minute, or the 30-minute, um, I'll glue the tube in, or uh, I'm sorry, epoxy the tube in, and uh, let it sit overnight. Some kits, and you can probably see this on film right here. Some kits come with the tube already scuffed up like this one. If your tube is shiny, just take some sandpaper. And what I'm doing is I'm just rubbing it back and forth and at the same time rolling it with my index finger. And you just scuff all the shiny off of it. That helps it give a little bit of adherence. You're going to, if you get into uh, pen turning and you get on YouTube or you get into forums, there's a huge argument about this. Do you need to scuff your tubes? Some people say, absolutely not. If you use the right glue, you don't need to scuff your tubes at all. Some people says, absolutely, you have to scuff your tubes. Well, I'm of the school, it takes five seconds. Why not? They say that they've never had one blow out, but okay. Well, they're not me. I'll have something blow out on me. Um, to do epoxy, I have a certain method for it. Um, in this particular instance, I'm using a little small white paper plate, but every two years, the United States Postal Service gives us some great items to put your epoxy on. They give tons and tons of these political flyers in your mailbox. You know, the flyers that have this list of false accomplishments and another list of promises that they're never going to keep. Take those, save them up, tear off a little, a little square off of one, 
and mix your epoxy on those. At least make some use out of that mess. Two inch masking tape. As you can see, I've just put some epoxy on the tube, twist, pull out at the same time, twist, pull it out a little bit, and take a toothpick, run that tube all the way through. You can see it dripping out on this side, but I take the edge of that toothpick and push the end of that tube, and then come on this back side, scrape off that excess that just pushed out, come around the back, the, the other side of the tube, Use that, push it down in there to where it, it's past the wood, and then take Q-tips and twist and roll them. So I'll use them for my ears after I get done with this. It basically takes two toothpicks or two Q-tips to do that. Just the one in. Yeah. And I'm not going to pass it around, but you can look through the tube and there is no epoxy on the inside of that tube. And again, I let it sit all night. Next thing you need to do is to trim the barrel. And what that means is you need to clear off the excess wood where it's square and 90 degrees to the tube. A um, couple of different ways to do this. I've seen people use a hand drill. Well, actually, I've, I've been guilty of that myself. But what I like to do if I'm at home and I've got my disc sander, and actually John brought a little sanding disc. I'm not going to do it this way, but I'm going to at least show you what it, what it is. So pretend this is my disc sander at home. And if you're any much of a, if you're much of a pin turner at all, you will have one of these. It's a punch set kit you can get for Harbor Freight for like 12 bucks. This is invaluable when it comes to pin turning because it's inevitably at some point in time, you will need these to take apart the pin that you just made because you will make a mistake. And the easiest thing about this is that once your components, once, it, once it's assembled, you can take these and punch them out. You just find the right one that's uh, for the particular tube that you, uh, pin that you're using. So what I do at home is I have a device called a squaring jig. But you take this squaring jig and on your table, you've got your little uh, miter gauge. Hold that up against there and twist or spin this as this is turning. And that will sand away the edge where it's 90 degrees to the barrel. The thing I like about this method is you can actually hear the barrel when you make contact with it. You can hear the tube when you make contact with it. There's a, a, a significant change in pitch and you need to be sanding on the outside. Or, or, or somewhere towards the outside. Now, there's a gentleman by the name of Rick Harrell, pinturners.org. This goes in your Jacobs chuck like I had with the drill. And instead of using this contraption, you use this contraption. This goes in here, similar to the way that I just had it. Like that. Now, that's at a 90 degrees. Let's pretend it's at a 90 degrees. That's at a 90 degree to your disc sander. And again, you just bring this up and the same principle applies. You're just spinning this while this is rotating and it sands your blank um, to 90 degrees. Three holes in there. And you can move that post to either one of those holes, which means you can get the three different positions on your sander. Yes. It's just that you wouldn't want to do it on the very center one. Like if you just put 
this in a Jacob's truck. You wouldn't want to do it in the center. But we're going to do it tonight. Now, I'm not going to do the other side, but <clears throat> you got the idea. Now that you can see shiny brass, you know that that... Now, again, you just want to get to the point where you can see the shiny brass. Don't be digging into it because you're just going to make your pin blank shorter and shorter and shorter, and then your pin won't work at all. Uh, the nib won't line up. And So, through the magic of television, we have one that's ready to go. So, earlier when I was talking about pin blanks, I, I forgot to mention about pin blank selection. And what I mean by that is all pin, all pin banks are going to be different because you know, they're all wood. But these two are both olive wood. And I wanted to point out, <clears throat> when you're selecting your pin blanks, I'll, can you go to the overhead? You want to look at the end grain. This one is going to have end grain throughout on both ends. This one has a lot of uh, grain patterns on this end, but not so much. Well, it, uh, about half and half. So once you turn it down to, to a pin, you're going to be chewing off a lot of that wood and you want to make sure that the pin blank that you get is not going to just have nice grain on one corner because that one corner is going to be gone when you get to <clears throat> when you start turning. So now we're going to start turning. A couple different ways that you can turn on the lathe is one is with a pin mandrel. The pin mandrel goes in your headstock. You have your pin bushings. This goes on one end. And where's the blank I was going to turn? Yeah, okay. Goes in that end. Goes there. Now, for this particular one, if you didn't have a mandrel saver, you're going to need to build up some spaces so this knob lock will be able to secure that blank where it won't spin on your mandrel. With what a mandrel, another thing, well, I don't like this way. This is the way I started, of course, but I don't like it anymore because even if you have that, if you even if you have all that secured, you're bringing up your 60 degree live, uh, live center, locking it in. And when you, if you push down on this too much, that mandrel is going to flex. And it's going to create an out of round pin blank. <clears throat> the next best thing, actually, I, I, I wouldn't recommend this way at all, is to use a mandrel saver. And what it, what it is, is just, it's a, a live center with a hole that accepts, let me get this out of the way. I just remember something I forgot to bring. This way, you can lock it up in there. And you've secured it. And there's not a, there's not a lot of mandrel that can flex. But this is fine. I, I, I would prefer this well over that other method. Because that, as you can see, that, that's going, that flexes. Well, one, I mean, yeah. Well, I mean, you you could straighten it out, but there again, you know, if with any type of flex, when you're dealing with a bowl this big around, that much is not going to make that much difference. But when you're dealing with something this small, it's going to make a world of difference. Oh, this is another thing I wanted to mention. <clears throat> when you get a little bit of age on you, these things are like gold when you're dealing with 
small items such as pins, trying to get the scratches out of them. I use these all the time. There is such a thing as turn between center adapters. I've got a set. I've used them one time. I didn't like them. And what it is, is your pin bushings. Of course, they have that little the hole on the, the, the hole that goes all the way through. They slide onto your pin blank. And what the turn what the turn between center adapters do is they let you use the bushings that you buy at Rockford Woodcraft Penn State. Um, it's it, it's one end goes into the spindle that goes on to there, and it doesn't go all the way through the pin blank. And then another the live center goes on this side. Again, it doesn't go all through the pin blank. It just sandwiches it in between. You, you're not using a mandrel. I didn't like it because I have found that the more that you put between this spindle and this live center, the more uh, room for play that you have. Um, say, for instance, uh, what I do with that, this disc, this disc center, and um, this is just a, as an example. <clears throat> this is for a one by eight, John. Okay, for a small lathe, one by eight, but with an adapter, one by eight to an inch and a quarter, it works. But when you're dealing with something with it, with like a pin blank, that can play a little bit on you. And I, that's the reason I did not like the turn between center adapters. Your moves may vary. Find what works for you. I just didn't like them myself. Um, what I prefer to do whenever I can, if I can't use the, the pin, sa uh, this uh, mandrel saver, is I use a 60 degree live center and a dead center. And all this is, is just a piece of uh, metal, Morse tape or two with a 60 degree cone on the end of it. And I use what are called turn between center bushings. These bushings, instead of the hole going all the way through, is they have a 60 degree indentation in there that fits onto here. Your pin blank fits in there. And this on the other side. <clears throat> Another thing I wanted to mention, at some point in time, you can either do it now or you can do it when you get finished with your pen, is to deburr your blank or your your um, your barrel. What happens is that when you trim that brass, it's it forms a little burr on the inside of that brass tube. Somebody, I think it might be Penn State, makes a, a deburring tool. It's just a little mechanism that rides around the end of there and it deburs the tool. I have found that using an awl does the exact same thing. Just put it in there, give it a little bit of twist, just enough to knock that burr down. That can help, that can make all the difference sometimes in your bushings going on. And it makes all the difference when you're assembling the pin. Yes, this is the way I do it. If I turn between centers, if I can do it this way, I'll do it this way. So just like at the beginning of our meeting with Joe's um, spindle gouge, we're gonna be using a spindle gouge as well because we need to take those corners, spindle, I'm sorry, not spindle gouge, spindle roughing gouge. We're gonna be using a spindle roughing gouge. This is the one, actually this particular tool by Craftsman, um, I don't even know if you can buy these anymore. This particular gouge, uh, the guy gave me when I bought my first lathe off of uh, Craigslist. And it is by far my favorite tool for this right here. And all I'm doing is I'm just taking the edges off with it. But like Joe had mentioned, high speeds are your friend. I'm running about 2,300 right now. So what I want to do is I want to just take 
take it down and make a general uh, the general shape of the blank toward the bushings. Now, as you can see, I don't know if you can see them or not. I've had these bushings for a very long time. And the more you use bushings, the more you're going to sand off of them. And it's going to make them smaller and smaller and smaller with every pin that you make. So what I like to do is I just use my bushings as a general guide. These are brand new bushings for this kit. These are old bushings for this kit. But as we can see with the calipers, if we mic them, I don't speak in thousands. That's a language I don't understand. I speak in millimeters and inches. Those are miking out at 1194, brand new. My old bushings are miking out at 1155. So almost a half a millimeter difference between the new bushings and the old bushings. But again, I'm just using those as a general guide. If you don't have the bushings, what you can do is you can find the part of the kit that actually gets pressed into the blank, and you can mic that out. And that comes out to, well, this is going to be, no, that's that's not a good one. That, that's the cap, or that's the, the clip part. Let me go down to where it, uh, where it actually meets the uh, the nib. So the new bushings mic'd out at 1194. The component itself mics out at 1209. So a little bit of difference. Um, calipers are your best friend for everything. I, I They're your best friend when you can find them in your shop. That's why I have about three or four sets, and I still have trouble finding them from time to time. But like Joe was mentioning earlier, speed is your friend when you're doing spindle turning. And never start from the end. Anchor, bevel, cut. I'm starting in the middle, working my way toward the bushings. And again, just making a general shape. This Paduk makes some really nice red sawdust. I'm not going to waste everybody's time, but what I do is I try to get it down there as close as I can to the bushings. And I know that there's uh, different schools in wood turning when it comes to high speed steel and carbide. Some people only use carbides, some people only use these, and they hate the other person that uses this and this, that, and the other. I use both. But what I'm doing here is I'm bringing it closer down to the bushing. And just for the sake of time, I'm going to bring that a little bit more. I'm going to do that one side a little bit more. Okay, for those of you that are proficient at SKUs, this is your time to shine. For those of you that like to cut yourself with SKUs, <laughs> I'll do a SKU at home by myself in my own shop with nobody watching. I'm not going to do it on the internet and all this other places. To bring it down to the final, I like to use... Um, this is essentially a negative rate scraper. It's made by uh, Speakeasy Tools. And I bring it down there just so I can hear the, I can hear comments from the peanut gallery. Speakeasy Tool. You know, like the, uh, the bars back in the Prohibition. Yeah. So what I say about 12 millimeters and that edge of that blank is miking out right now at 12.4, which is where I would go a little bit more and then stop because the sanding will get 
that wrist of that um, half a millimeter off for you. And I brought some sandpaper, I think. Yeah, here it is. I use Abernet. It's reusable. Just blow the dust out of it. But I'm not going to be sanding this Padute very much. Sand it this way. And I don't know the proper terminology, but that's going to put scratches going in this direction. Radial, thank you. You need to take the same grit and take those scratches out, which is lateral. Oh, big word for me. With the grain, yes. Yeah. This way and this way. <laughs> back and forth. Yeah, back, thank you, back and forth. But you do that with every grit. You do that, I start out with 120. Um, on a wood blank, and let me speak a little bit about, about wood blanks. Um, if, if you're making a blank out of historical wood or some wood with uh, some ex significance to you, whether it be um, a whiskey barrel, uh, a, a, tr a tree that grew up in your great aunt's backyard that you want to make a pen out of, um, instead of putting a CA finish on it, which CA is essentially a plastic coating over that wood, you're not going to be able to feel the wood uh, when you're writing with the pen, which is why I like to use a friction polish when it comes to uh, wood pens that have some sort of significance. It's a lot easier. We could sit here and talk until uh, April about CA finishes. I will mention one thing about CA finishes. If you choose to do one, there's plenty of YouTube videos out there on how to do them. This is the cheapest, cheapest CA glue that you can get. It's stick fast. I would not recommend it for any pen. Um, it is, it's very brittle. I started, well, actually, I mean, come to think about it, that walnut pen that I passed around, that was with stick fast. So apparently I've done something right with that pen, but I have had numerous issues with stick fast. It clouds up. Um, you let a pen sit in a room for about six months, and um, you can see it start clouding up. What I use now is this was CA glue that's specifically designed for pen turning. It's called Mercury Flex. It's CA glue that has a little bit of flex to it, not a lot, but a little bit of flex, and you get the same amount of shine. Um, but again, that's, that's all I'm going to talk about the CA finishes because you can just talk forever about it. So I'm going to jump into friction polish. Again, there are several different friction polishes out there. Uh, Mylands friction polish. There's uh, Aussie oil. I use a product called Doctor's Woodshop Pin Plus. They're all essentially the same thing. They're all um, linseed oil, um, beeswax, and shellac. Get my bushings out here. This is a lot faster than CA as well. I've used this bottle a time or two. So I just want to get it soaked in there really good right now. Everything has. No, you can you can make your own, but that you're going to, you're going to pay for that too. This has uh, walnut oil, shellac, and micro aggregated synthetic wax and denatured alcohol. So I don't know why they aggregated the. That's another thing I meant to mention is uh, denatured alcohol. Before you do this, before you put any CA finish on a pen, before you finish a pen, period. After you finish sanding, use denatured alcohol. For those across the pond, it's what, methylated spirits? For those in California, I'm sorry, they don't even sell it there. It's outlawed.
I think acetone is going to eat. Is going to. It's. I've never used acetone, but I don't. I, I, that's that's. I don't know what it'll do with this though. If it gets in there to the epoxy, it may loosen it. That's acetone is very very strong. But if you got denatured alcohol, use denatured alcohol. Get that get that speed up to about three thousand. And I'm just rubbing back and forth, building up the heat. We'll stop, let it cool off. Put another little dab on you. And if you feed it in from the bottom like that, you're not going to get any splash. Just feed it gently in from the bottom. And rub that back and forth. I, I want to feel the heat through the paper towel. And for the last one, I'm just going to put a little bit on here. and really crank it up. This time I want it to burn my fingers. I, I, I think it's, honestly, I think it's the same thing with like um, any type of wood product like bowls. At some point in time, they need to be refinished. Um, I'm sure at, the, at some point in time, this will need to be refinished. You know, just take a little bit of beeswax, smear it on there, and it kind of buff it. And that should take care of it. So I'll take the uh, the bushings out of the blank. We're done with, done with those tools. And what I like to do here is take the paper towel and kind of give those ends just a little bit of twist. Clean them, clean them up just a little bit. Now, even, even something like this, I touched it too soon. And I can see my fingerprint. I can see a little bit of smudge in there because I touched it too soon. It's best to let it cool down completely before you touch it. So when it comes to assembly, you've got a couple of different options as well. One of them is you can use uh, for those Irwin quick grip clamps. You can use those. You can use, uh, you can actually use your lathes. You put like a, a waste block on your spindle and a dead center that's not pointed on this side, you can actually use this part to uh, assemble your pin blanks. Did you know if you drop one of these springs in your shop, you will never find it? Yeah, ever. I dropped one, dropped one a couple months ago, and usually you can, you can hear just a little bit. I heard nothing. It felt, I don't know what happened to it. It, it was gone forever. You have to forgive me. It's been a little while since I put one of these together. Okay. Now I remember. All right. Um, I'm going to set this somewhere where I won't knock it off. Yeah. So this is an old but used pin press. And there's one little thing that I wanted to show you is if you take the bushings and you put it on the back side of the pin that you're making, that gives that entire side of that blank a little bit of support other than pressing directly onto the blank itself. Put that in there like that. Again, I have used this thing a thousand times. Make sure it's squared up right. You may have to wiggle it just a little bit and then firmly press it in. Yeah, I'll take the board now. Thank you.
So now that we've got it assembled together, or at least the components that actually go on the pin itself, we can start screwing in the components. And the transmission. Give the transmission a little bit of twist. Make sure that that grease is lubricating the entire transmission. Put it together. And there's your finished pin. There. Signed in everything.